All right, they are the Florida Gators, and right now they're probably ranked fourth in their state, if you really think about it. Yeah, Florida State's the national champions. Miami had a decent season with eight wins. Central Florida, better than Florida right now. The Gators coming off an embarrassing 4-8 and eight campaign, and we bring in Brian Lee of Bleacher Report to talk about the Gators, and I think this is one of the more intriguing situations in the country right now. We know what the recruiting base is. We know that they've got talent on the roster, but they've got a coach who's on the hot seat. They play in an extremely tough conference, the best in college football, and they're coming off of an embarrassing 4-8 and eight campaign. So, so, Brian, let's talk about the quarterback situation because this isn't going to get too many Gators excited unless they appreciate Jeff Driscoll and what he brought this football team two years ago in winning 11 games. I know that the stats weren't heavy. They were like second to last in the SEC in passing, but he's at least a versatile quarterback. He kept the chains moving and moved a lot of third down chains with his legs. So your thoughts on Jeff Driscoll uh, coming into 2014 after being injured and missing most of uh, 13? Yeah, well, I think you're fighting an uphill battle to to ask Florida fans to, to, to feel good about what Jeff Driscoll was in the past. Uh, you can get him excited for what he can be this year. Um, the, the whole talk of camp has been Kurt Roper, who, of course, came in, replaced Brent Pease this offseason. Um, they've been doing a lot of stuff from the shotgun. They ran some no huddle in the spring game, which is all the stuff that Florida fans have been saying Jeff Driscoll should be doing this whole time. He came in as a dual-threat quarterback. He's really good outside the pocket. They haven't had the weapons on the outside to spread it out, and now they think they do, and if they don't, they're going to go down trying. Um, so Jeff Driscoll's had a lot of uh, apologists like myself making excuses for him the past couple years. He's out of excuses this year. He's got the right coordinator. He's a good fit. Florida fans, he's, on a, he's, he's got a really short leash, but I think they're, they're hoping for the best from him. And in an SEC where every quarterback just left, it's, it's not crazy to think that he could be one of the, the three or four best this year. Okay, I'm going to make one more disclaimer for Jeff Driscoll, so I'm going to defend him one more time because if we go back two years ago, I think his touchdown-to-pick ratio was 15-6. to six. He moved the chains again. He rushed for a lot of yardage, like six, seven hundred yards uh, on the ground. Moved the chains. The Gators threw the ball less than almost any team in the country. They averaged like 21 passes per game. So they were basically saying, "Let's give it to Mike Gillisley between the tackles, get a touchdown on the board, win this game like 13 to six or 13 to nine." So they didn't really give him the opportunity to score points. And of course, we know what the wide receiver play has been like surprisingly at Florida. This is a state that produces so many four and five star recruits that actually I've talked to some people around the state uh, specifically that uh, cover Miami and also Florida, Florida State and the, the, the abundance of riches are so great down there that these schools typically have to turn away four star recruits. <laughs> they can't recruit them all. They don't have enough scholarships for all of them and Florida can't find a wide receiver that's going to catch 50 or 60 passes. It's unbelievable that for the past five years there's been such a dry spell in regards to playmakers at Florida. Is there hope for 2014, Brian? There is. Uh, I mean, I don't think there's a Percy Harvin on the roster, but there's definitely hope that'll be better than last year. Uh, Demarcus Robinson has been unguardable at times in camp, um, which is saying something. We'll get to their cornerbacks later, but if, 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 if there's parts of camp that you're unguardable during, you're doing it against the best. Um, Quinn Dunbar's back. Uh, they've got some young guys they really like. Uh, a guy named Ahmad Fullwood, uh, Chris Thompson. These guys who are... Chris Thompson's really fast. He's really good in space. He's the kind of guy that an old must-champ offense <laughs> would let go to waste. Uh, but if this spread it out, if this if this no huddle attack that they they showed in the spring game is for real, if you know if that's not just you know Muschamp letting Roper have fun in the spring and he's going to make him ugly it up in the fall, me, these guys can get out in space and do some things. Uh, it just we have to see what they do once the games start counting. I didn't get a chance to see much of Kelvin Taylor last year. He came into college football as, uh, depending on your service, number one recruited running back in the country. His statistics, considering, again, 
not just looking at the stats themselves, but considering the situation, no threat of a passing attack, no real threat on the outside. Defenses were loading the box. Kelvin Taylor had a pretty good back half of 2013 as a true freshman. Uh, you've got uh, what we're considering a bowling ball. You'll explain that to us uh, coming up here at the running back position. You also have Mac Brown. So the running backs, uh, I, I think they have something to work with here, but they're going to need some threat from the outside passing game to kind of open some things up for the backs. Yeah, definitely. Um, the running back, the running game, I'll say, was a disappointment last year. Obviously, everything was a disappointment last year. Um, but the string of injuries on the offensive line is, I think, a viable excuse uh, for why Kelvin Taylor was, didn't look like the best running back in the country last year. He's supposedly having a really good camp. Um, again, these, these are the things you have to take with a grain of salt until you can really see it. Uh, but he supposedly has a, a spring in his step that he didn't have last spring or last fall, where he actually looks like a lead back. I mean, you have Mac Brown there as a 1A, 1B kind of thing. Yeah, you're in pretty good shape, uh, especially with the guy you alluded to earlier, uh, this redshirt freshman, Adam Lane, who I can't wait to watch. Uh, everyone's talking about uh, the quarterback, Jeremy Liggins at Ole Miss, the biggest quarterback. I love this guy who's the smallest but stockiest running back I've ever seen. He's five foot seven, 222 pounds, and he bowls people over. He's awesome. He's He's going he's gonna to show up a lot on Twitter, I think, next year when, when he starts making plays. So at 5'7", uh, whatever it was, 225, 230, I want people out there that are watching this video to think about somebody that we can compare him to because I'm, I'm, I'm racing through my, my knowledge of rosters uh, for the last 25 years, and I'm not coming up with anybody with those kind of dimensions, 5'7". Yeah, yeah, I think of Craig Ironhead Hayward, but he was like six feet tall. He looked short because he was so big. But he was not five seven. Yeah, so, I'd, uh, I'd give him Maurice Jones, Drew. I don't know if he has the speed, but that that little power in the pool. There you go. Definitely still playing some football in Jacksonville. <laughs> one of the one of the few uh, yeah. down there on the roster that still. Uh, I think he might actually be gone. Yeah, he will probably be gone this year. That's right. All right. Brian, let's look at the defense here because we finally get to a unit that we can talk about that actually looks like it should be a Florida Gators unit on this football team. We've talked about the disappointment at quarterback, running back, and wide receiver in recent years. Now we get to the defense where the secondary has not disappointed, and despite some losses, they should be able to continue the recent tradition of uh, awesome, freakish-type football players in that secondary. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. They... They lose three guys who could go early in the NFL draft in Lucie's Purifoy, uh, Marcus Roberson, and uh, I'm sorry, Jalen Watkins. And they also lose uh, Cody Riggs, who transferred to Notre Dame. So, I mean, that's a lot of talent for one unit to lose, and they come back and might still be one of the best in the country. Uh, you still got Vernon Hargraves, who m might have arguably been an All-American-type cornerback last year. You bring in Jalen Tabor as a five-star, who uh, I, I followed closely when he was in high school. He's a Maryland product. Uh, my Terps really wanted him. He goes down to Florida. Supposedly, he's looked like a, in the second coming of Richard Sherman in camp. Um, the, the bigger questions are at safety. Uh, they've got a guy in Marcel Harris who's running on the second team right now. He was a real big recruit last year. Um, never really put it together. Sat out the year with an injury. But he's coming on at the end of camp. Uh, he can push guys like Marcus May for their job. If they can find some safety play, I think they'll be okay at corner because they also have Duke Dawson, another early enrollee who's looked really good this spring. And, yeah, it, it'll come down to the safeties. We'll define how good their secondary is. Anything else on defense in looking at uh, the game notes and what you were able to take from the spring game? Anything uh, that stands out in regards to this defense that still, despite the eight losses last season, despite all the injuries, still played like one of the better defenses in the SEC? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to miss Dante Fowler. Um, he's finally, I think, playing the way they've always wanted him to play. He, he came in in really good shape. Uh, they need him. He's, he's their only really, really high-level pass rusher. They need him to have a kind of Jarvis Jones-like season for them this year. Um, the linebacker stuff, they, they need Antonio Morrison to, 
to not do what he did last year, Wonder Dog. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Morrison had a great freshman year, got arrested for barking at a police dog in the offseason, had a really a tough season, got replaced. Um, they need him to play well. If Him and Gerard Davis, who's the guy who replaced him, can form a tandem instead of competing with each other. This this team will be pretty solid on defense once again. Okay, Brian, we're going to talk about Will Muschamp. So <laughs> I'm going to present the case, and you give me the for or the against. Uh, Will Muschamp, let's not forget that even though Urban Meyer's reign at Florida was pretty spectacular, the last season was not so much. They were still a really good football team, one of the best 15 or 20 teams in the country. But they went 8-5, and five, barely beat Penn State in a bowl game to finish off. Urban Meyer's run at Florida. Muschamp comes in, goes six and six, wins a bowl game in the Gator, goes seven and six, has the really good eleven and two season, which finished out on a downer, and that seems to be what everybody remembers uh, in regards to 2012, and that they didn't look pretty winning those games, but they did win eleven games and really took it to Florida State as well out of conference. So that was a tough eleven wins against a top top schedule in 2012. Then they come crashing down to 2-6 and six in the SEC and only 4-8 and eight overall. So in your opinion, Will Muschamp is on the hot seat, I would think. What does he need to do to keep his job? He's definitely on the hot seat. I don't know if he needs to win the division to keep his job, but they need to stay competitive in the division for him to keep his job. Um, I think it goes without saying they should be better than they were last year. Um... <laughs> He'll be gone. He'll be gone the way Lane Kiffin was gone if they're not. Um, but I think they they have a realistic shot to compete in this division. The schedule shapes up really nicely. Um, their only road games in the conference are at Alabama, Tennessee, and Vanderbilt. I think. Um, so they're really getting all their biggest. SC I mean, obviously they play Georgia on the neutral field. They're getting Missouri and Florida. They're getting South Carolina and Florida. I think they get LSU in Florida. There, there's no excuse for this team to really not win eight or nine games if you're going to count the bowl nine. Um, I think if he gets them there, it, it's hard to fire a guy after an eight and four season, I guess. But it's also Florida, and it's. I think he'd do well to win nine games. <laughs> and for those people out there that are chuckling right now when we're thinking about a turnaround from four and eight to possibly nine and four, let's keep in mind that this time last year, what were we thinking about Auburn and Missouri, who were a combined two and fourteen in the SEC the season before? Two and fourteen in the SEC, exactly. and they turn around to go to a national championship game, and for Missouri, uh, finish in the top ten. So. It can be done. It's going to be extremely difficult against what they have to face in the Eastern Division, although, as we noted and talked about before we came on, we're talking about an SEC that's minus the probably the best quarterback class in the history of the league, leaving still exceptional talent, still the best league in the country, but Jeff Driscoll, one of the veterans, one of the few veterans that will be back here in 2014. All right, Brian Lee writes for Bleacher Report, does some exceptional work, and we basically throw him football teams and he can respond to anything. Has no specialties. It's basically specialties across the board. Brian, we appreciate your time and your insight into anybody we bring up in college football. <laughs> I appreciate the kind words and your time.